Please welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Leila Moomin, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. Thank you for attending the webinar, Drug Approval and Reimbursement Processes in Canada. We are pleased to welcome back our presenter, Ryan Clark, who has done a number of webinars with us in the past. Ryan is the president and founder of Advocacy Solutions, where he helps advocates synthesize advocacy campaigns, amplify campaign messaging, and engage and influence key decision makers through the development and implementation of impactful advocacy strategies. Since founding the practice in 2003, Ryan has spoken about advocacy issues across Canada and internationally, teaching and training thousands of people on how to make their voices heard. In today's webinar, uh, Ryan will take attendees through an overview of the drug approval and reimbursement processes. He will also provide a review of the updated CADIS patient group clinician input processes and provide everyone with a better understanding of how the processes are connected and flow into one another. At the end of the presentation, Ryan will be able to answer your questions. However, at any time during the webinar, please feel free to type any questions you have into the question tab on your control panel. For those of you who have not attended an earlier webinar, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about health system complexities, connect with others to plan action, and act to promote best care and healthier survivorship. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at survivornet.ca. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. In addition, the slides will be available on SlideShare. Links to both will be sent to the email you provided. I will now turn things over to Ryan. Thanks, Leila, and welcome, everybody. Um, so this is an overview of what I want to talk to you about in the context of the drug approval and reimbursement processes in Canada, our agenda. Many of these steps, if you will, have undergone some significant changes in the last year, so I'll be highlighting those in particular. And just a reminder to those who may have heard me uh, present previously on this topic at some point over the last 15 years or so, it remains quite complicated and constantly changing. So while I deal with it every day, I would still not profess to be an expert on the entirety of what I'm going to take you through. And we're not going to go deep into any particular um, piece um, because of time constraints. And so if I miss something, uh, it's just uh, likely a product of, uh, of that restriction. So here are the webinar outcomes. Layla just read them to you, so I'll skip over those and we'll just go straight into the beginning. So this is the overall drug approval and reimbursement or listing uh, process in Canada or series of processes. It's a number of processes, it's not one process. It's important to recognize the various roles here. Uh, the federal government approves medications for sale, regulates their use, issues patents, regulates prices, monitors R&D levels by the pharmaceutical industry, administers the special access program, which we're gonna talk a little bit about, and is one of the single largest purchasers of drugs. That's what the federal government does. The provinces uh, play a different role. They review medications for listing on their public formularies. They set reimbursement criteria and negotiate prices. Uh, constant reminder, if you were with us in our previous webinar, under the Constitution Act, Section 92, the delivery of health care is almost exclusively within the context of provincial jurisdiction. And then, specifically in health care, there are these joint federal provincial processes, which I'll call national processes, just to differentiate them from federal and provincial. These national processes include uh, CDR, uh, PCOTR, and PCPA, all of which we're gonna talk about uh, today, obviously. I will not be talking about clinical trials or research. And just before we leave this slide, you'll, you'll notice um, that pricing does not appear on this slide, and that's because pricing actually runs concurrently across this entire timeline. Uh, pricing in Canada is not a moment in time. <clears throat> it's a continuous process, and I'll expand on that a little bit more in a moment when I get to that section. So here's the schematic that I just saw you that, that 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 you just saw on the previous page, but in words, essentially it's the same. It's just everything you just saw, but in words. So public formularies are impacted by federal, provincial, and national processes. And many of you may know this, of course. Manufacturer submits to Health Canada for approval. That's the first step. 
uh, then the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, CADIF, operates two uh, uh, pan-Canadian drug review processes. First one's called the Common Drug Review, CDR. They review non-oncology drugs, and, and, and Quebec is not part of CADIF. And then uh, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, PCOTR, deals with uh, cancer drugs. Uh, again, Quebec outside of the entirety of CADIF, including um, Common Drug Review and uh, uh, PCOTR. You may also know that CADIF does many other things other than just manage the Common Drug Review and PCOTR. I'm not going to go into any of that um, as part of this discussion. The Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance conducts joint federal-provincial-territorial negotiations for brand name drugs in Canada. Again, many of you will be familiar with this. And then the provinces also review new drugs and make the final reimbursement decisions through product listing agreements. Again, why do they make the decisions? Because of the Constitution. So Health Canada approves. Uh, then we're into a series of recommendations. And then the final decision is up to the provinces. And again, we'll, we'll go through all of this today. So let's start with the special access program. This is an important program for patients waiting for a drug to come to Canada. Uh, it is a program that is administered by Health Canada, and it considers requests for access to drugs that are not yet available or approved in Canada by physicians. Only a physician can make application for a drug. Uh, and there's a very clear set of criteria here, and I've quoted them for you. Patients with serious or life-threatening conditions when conventional treatments have failed are unsuitable or unavailable. I actually should have put that in quotes. That's a direct, directly from the SAP uh, program uh, page on the Health Canada website. Um, as I said, requests have to come from a healthcare professional or prescriber, but SAP does not deal with funding of the medication. It just simply says, Yes, you can bring, yes, physician, we will grant you the ability to bring this drug into Canada to treat this patient. But then somebody else has to figure out, not Health Canada, who's going to pay for this particular medication. And then um, just that last bullet in red, uh, because this is relatively new, I didn't know this until I sat down to update the slide. Some of you might have known um, that, um, that uh, Health Canada has introduced um, some amend or has announced that it plans to introduce some amendments uh, to two pieces of legislation that would prohibit uh, psychedelic therapies to come in through SAP potentially, and they're not they're not now because they're prohibited because of the narcotic control regulations. Drug approvals: a new drug submission typically involves between 100 and 800 binders of data. It's electronic now. Uh, but essentially the equivalent of containing scientific information about the product's safety, efficacy, and quality. Health Canada is concerned about safety, efficacy, and quality. We can't remember that. We can't forget that third one, quality. Most people talk about safety and e efficacy. Quality as well. Quality is the quality of the ingredient, the physical matter that goes into your body, be it a pill or whatever it is. If at the completion of the review, the conclusion is that the benefits outweigh the risks, and that the risks can be mitigated, the drug is issued a notice of compliance or a notice of compliance with conditions, which permits the manufacturer to market the drug in Canada. So just note for a second, the test for safety is a two-part test. First part is, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And the answer has to be yes, in order to go to the second question, which is, and can the risks as identified, be mitigated? If the answer to both of those questions is yes, then you have passed the safety test. The test is not, will the drug harm nobody? Is the drug perfectly safe? Or anything like that, that's not the test. The test is what I just sort of outlined to you, and so it's very important to, to know and understand that that's the metric against which safety, of those three things, safety, efficacy, and quality, but safety is measured against that uh, uh, that two-part test. Um, and also note as well, as again, many of you will know, the drug approval process through Health Canada um, is closed to the public. You can't see or formally participate in the deliberations with very few exceptions. There's some very, very minor exceptions, but for all intents and purposes, it is a closed process. 
which by the way differs from other jurisdictions, which are much more transparent, much more open. Pricing. In Canada, we have regulated prices for patented or brand name drugs through the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board, known as the PMPRB. Note that price and cost mean two different things with respect to pharmaceuticals in Canada. They're two different words, they mean two different things in this context. The price of a drug, essentially, and I'm simplifying this, is the maximum amount that a manufacturer can sell the drug for. That's the price. Let's say it's a dollar. They are free to sell it for less than a dollar, but they can't sell it for more than a dollar. That's essentially what the function of PMPRB is. Again, oversimplifying it tremendously, but that's it, essentially. The cost is what the various customers pay for that $1 drug, and including private insurance companies, uh, potentially even consumers, uh, through out of pocket, um, but certainly the provinces and the territories will typically pay less. 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents, whatever it may be, but it's not typically a dollar. It used to be at one time, 20 years ago, a dollar at PMPRB is a dollar is what everybody paid, but not anymore. Um, there are some significant changes coming at PMPRB or that, that have come to PMPRB. Again, most of you will be familiar with those. The only thing I want to point out here is that the date of implementation of the reforms they were supposed to come into effect actually last year, then January 1st. They've now been delayed coming into effect until July 1st. Uh, there are a number of changes, but they are um, they have been further delayed. Um, the process for determining the PMPRB price can begin even prior to approval of a drug by Health Canada and technically continues throughout the life cycle of the product due to PMPRB's what is called their price review power, price review power. Uh, and that essentially means that they have the jurisdiction under legislation to manage the price, for lack of a better word, throughout the product's life cycle. So they don't just set a price and then go away. They manage the price throughout the life cycle. And uh, this is what I was referring to when I said that pricing runs concurrently across that timeline I showed uh, earlier. So now we're going to shift to the next part of the process, health technology assessment, or the do we want to pay for these drugs out of public funds phase sort of thing. Okay. Now, just a note, I alluded to this a moment ago, but I, I want to make it clear. There are only three ways to get a medication in this country with a prescription. So I'm not talking about clinical trials. I'm not talking about compassionate use. I'm talking about drugs proved. Uh, it's on the market and you have a prescription and you want to fill it. There's only three ways. One, you can pay cash. You can go in and you can pay cash. In most drugs, there are some, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, you can, you can pay for a drug that you want. Again, I'm not referring to drugs that are delivered in a hospital or something like that. I'm talking about outside of a hospital, you have a prescription, you want to go fill it. Cash, out of pocket. Number two, private insurance. If you have private insurance through your place of employment or you've gone out into the marketplace and you've purchased private insurance, your private insurance may cover that prescription under certain circumstances, keeping in mind that there might be annual caps on how much you can, um, uh, you're allowed to, to uh, consume. Uh, there may be lifetime caps on how much uh, you can consume in terms of medications. And then the third way, the only other way, is through one of the public formularies. If you qualify, that's the first step, you have to qualify for the public formulary. And then secondly, if the public formulary covers that particular medication under whatever circumstances um, may be applicable to you in the context of that prescription. So again, only three ways. There is no other way in Canada. So um, let's talk a bit about uh, the common drug review. In terms of the process, a manufacturer or a drug plan files a submission for a new drug to the common drug review, in the case of the common drug review, uh, non-oncology. The common drug review team, uh, or a common drug review team is established, typically consisting of uh, clinical reviewers, pharmacoeconomic reviewers, a clinical specialist, 
an information specialist and other project people. And they are the ones that review uh, the, uh, uh, the medication through a committee called the Canadian Drug Expert Committee, CDEC. There is a public record of all final recommendations, as I'm sure many of you know, and other relevant materials are posted on the CADETH website as it pertains to any particular drug that is going through the CDR uh, process. There is a parallel process for oncology drugs that are seeking public reimbursement in Canada. Uh, so again, PCODER as it's called, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, also part of CADETH, uh, they may, uh, uh, the committee that reviews that is called the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review Expert Review Committee, or the PERC. Um, and they, just like the CDR, make recommendations to the provinces and territories, except Quebec, in guiding, in this case, the cancer funding decisions. Um, and they take into account evidence that is uh, similar to what uh, uh, CDR does, uh, including patient groups, drug manufacturers, clinical-based tumor groups, that's unique to oncology, and the PCODER Provincial uh, Advisory Group. Let's talk next about how stakeholder input is provided during the CADETH um, phase. So a bit of history here for everybody. Um, introduced in 2010 at CDR and 2011 at PCODER was this opportunity for patient groups to provide input into the review of a medication going through CADETH, either CDR or PCODER. It provided those groups, not individuals, individual patients or caregivers initially, um, to, provide, uh, to provide that input by filling out a template. There was a template if you were in PCODER oncology, and then there was a different template if you were in CDR non-oncology. And both templates consisted of a series of prompting questions, questions that you as a patient group were asked to answer to help to provide feedback or input into this review from the patient perspective. Input was provided prior to the commencement of the review and oncology groups, so on the PCODER side, had to register with CADETH to have their input accepted. You didn't have to register if you were on the CDR or non-oncology side, but you had to register if you were on the PCODER side. Then around 2016, a couple of things a couple of changes came into effect. For the first time, individual patients and caregivers could provide input where no patient group existed. This is really important, where no patient group existed. And on the oncology side, PCODER, patient groups were given a second chance to provide input, technically called feedback, after CADETH issued a draft recommendation on the drug review. So over on the CDR side, you provided input ahead of time if you were a patient group, and that was it, After all the way through this process. But on the PCODER side, the, the uh, oncology side, around 2016, they changed it so that if you were a patient group, you not only got to provide input up front before the review, but you also got to provide what was called feedback, still is, called feedback after the initial or draft recommendation was made by that committee I showed you a moment ago uh, called the PERC, okay? Now, that's the patient group history. Now let's talk about the clinician input history. Introduced in February 2016, only in P on the PCODER side, only on the oncology side, and initially just for physicians. Um, so there was no, and had never been any opportunity for non-oncology medications or clinicians who treat outside of oncology for medications that were going through this process, only in oncology. It provided individuals uh, or groups of physicians the opportunity to provide input into the review process around a particular drug, again, by filling out a similar template with similar prompting questions, except from a clinician's perspective, not from a patient group perspective. The topic areas were the same, mirrored almost exactly uh, the same, 
but the perspectives were, were different, obviously. Input was provided both at the commencement of the review and feedback was provided on the issuance after a draft recommendation. So two opportunities to comment. Just like the patient groups in 2016 on the oncology side got two opportunities to provide input, the clinicians on the oncology side always had two opportunities uh, for, for input. And this is very important, Physicians who were providing input had to register with P coder. Had to register. And then three years ago, the definition of clinician was expanded to include, <clears throat> excuse me, oncology pharmacists and oncology nurses. However, they had to go in under the umbrella of a clinician. You could, oncology pharmacists couldn't go in by themselves, they had to go in under the umbrella of a clinician. All of this has changed. All of this has changed. There's still some remnants of it left, but there have been significant changes and a significant streamlining to this to both processes starting in the fall of last year. So, on the patient group side, there is a single patient input submission now for both oncology and non-oncology reviews for both CDR and PCoder. So, one form Two, there will be an opportunity for patient groups to provide uh, both upfront input and feedback to draft recommendations. Now, not only in oncology, which they've been able to do since 2016, but also now in non-oncology, in CDR. And patient groups need not register anymore. And individual patient caregiver input is still allowed where there's no applicable Canadian patient group. Some big changes here. Now, note that CADIF does have a definition of what constitutes a patient group. It's on their website uh, for the purposes of drug reimbursement reviews, and I'll read it to you. This is a quote. A patient group is an organized group that represents patients with a specific disease or condition or collection of diseases or conditions. An interested patient group can provide input. We, this is CADIF speaking, we hear from small Facebook support groups and large national charities, close quote. Note as well that patient groups from outside of Canada can provide input, that's important to know, and Canadian patient groups can provide perspectives and experiences from And they're important, as I'm sure many of you will recognize, because oftentimes the drug that is under review, the whole reason for all of this input, is not available in Canada at all. There may have been no clinical trials, and it may have never been brought in through the special access program. There may have never been a compassionate program set up. There may literally be not one person in the country who has ever tried the medication or has ever prescribed the medication for somebody in Canada. Having recognized that, CADIF then now allows for patient groups from outside of Canada uh, to provide input and also for Canadian groups to seek input from people outside of Canada. And I shouldn't say now, that, that's been in place for some time, but I want to be clear that that's now on their website. They now explicitly say they will accept that kind of input. That's important. On the clinician side today, again, significantly streamlined. Clinician submissions can now be made by clinicians in the non-oncology space using, again, a common template. So just like the patients who now have one template, regardless of whether it's CDR or PCoder, now the clinicians have one template for both oncology and non-oncology. This is big news that non-oncology clinicians now get to provide input. This is huge. But they must do so in the context of groups or associations or uh, of healthcare professionals. Individual clinician submissions will now only be accepted where there is no relevant group or association. This is a 180 degree turn from when clinician input submission first emerged at P Coder back in February 2016. If you go back to those original documents, 
it talks almost exclusively about individual clinicians providing input. It allows for, for individuals to come together as groups. But the thrust of those first documents, that first opportunity for clinician input on, on the oncology side, really contemplated individual clinicians doing this. That's gone. Um, they want groups of clinicians now. All clinicians will have the opportunity to provide input both upfront before the review is initiated and feedback to a draft recommendation in both oncology and non-oncology reviews. And this is very important, there is no longer a registration requirement for individual physicians who want to participate or anyone else. All registration requirements, patient side, clinician side, are gone. They've been eliminated. That's a significant streamlining of the process. So we are left then with three CADETH templates, only three CADETH templates now. The first one is entitled a reimbursement review patient input template. That's for all patient groups to use when they first provide input prior to the review getting underway or contemporaneous with the review getting underway. Secondly, there's a document entitled Reimbursement Review Clinician Group Input Template for all clinician groups to use, again, contemporaneous with the initiation of a review. And then finally, there's a document called <clears throat> the Reimbursement Review Feedback on Draft Recommendation. That's for everybody. That's for all the patient groups who may have provided initial input, for all of the clinician groups, who may have provided initial input, irrespective of CDR or um, P coder. In terms of timing, many of you will be familiar with this. Initial input opens 20 days prior to the target date for submission by the manufacturer to CADETH. Um, the manufacturer is required in their communication with CADETH prior to submitting uh, their file to give them a target date. We will deliver our file on X date. That becomes the target, it's called the target submission date. And so CADETH opens up the opportunity for input by patient groups and clinician groups 20, day, uh, yeah, 20 days prior, 20 business days, excuse me, prior, and then closes it 15 business days later. So you have a total of 35 business days to provide that initial input. Then after a draft recommendation is issued by CADETH, the same patient and clinician groups that provided initial input, you can't have new people coming into this equation, it's only the people that provided uh, initial input, are then given 10 business days to provide feedback on that draft recommendation. That's template number three you see on the screen. Uh, and as best I can tell, all of these completed templates are now posted on the CADETH website. It was a bit of hit, it was a bit hit and miss before. They weren't consistent at posting these uh, submissions before, but I think now they they they're they're pretty aligned, and I think they all get posted in a relatively timely manner. So let's talk about each of these templates, or at least let's touch on each of these templates um, uh, before we move on from here. So the first template, the one entitled Reimbursement Review Patient Input Template for all the patient groups to use around an initial input, provides a series of prompting questions under each of the input areas that are listed there on the screen. The prompting questions specifically address caregivers as well as patients. And you can see the areas that they're interested in. Now, the reason they provide these areas is to keep the patient group focused, focused on what it is that is important to the reviewers in the context of their work. And so that's why you have all of these sub areas. And then within these sub areas, you have, again, what I call prompting questions. And well, it's not a test, you don't have to answer these questions. The questions are there to further focus the input provided or requested or needed by the committee that's reviewing uh, the medication. So that's why this is there. Be sure to read the conflict of interest section questions carefully to provide CADETH with exactly the information that they're requesting. Uh, that's the appendix that's noted there. 
I want to emphasize this. Read it very carefully. Um, the initial conflict of interest declarations years ago were very broad and very loose. The language was not tight. This language is much tighter. It's much more specific. And read it carefully, understand it, and answer what they want you to answer uh, in, in, a, in a way that is exactly uh, what they're looking for. The second template, the reimbursement uh, review clinician group input template, as I said to you, follows something that is parallel to what the patient groups do. So again, you've got these broad areas that they want input on. You've then got prompting questions uh, within them. There's about two dozen prompting questions. There's a lot of content in this now common clinician group uh, input template. Um, uh, under these under these sub areas, as it says, uh, note, uh, and this is very important. This is a quote from the conflict of interest declaration section for the clinician group template. Each clinician that contributed to the input, close quote. So I'll read it again. Quote: Each clinician that contributed to the input, close quote, must complete a conflict of interest declaration. So let me give you a practical example of what I'm talking about. Because I know many patient groups manage the clinician input submissions for uh, for their uh, for their clinicians. So this is important to understand this. Let's say that as part of populating a clinician group input template, you want to do a survey of treaters, prescribers, clinicians. And let's say it's a pretty large therapeutic area, and you send out 100 um, surveys to 100 people. And you get back 30 responses. Now, it says each clinician that contributed to the input must complete a conflict of interest declaration. So what does that mean practically? Does that mean 100 people need to fill this out? No. No, you, you sent it out to 100 people, but 100 people did not contribute to the input. Does it mean that the 30 people who responded to your survey have to fill out a conflict of interest declaration? Yes, I believe so. I believe it meets the definition that they contributed to the input. So something to keep in mind, if you are managing these, this, this process, the clinician group process, keep in mind that if, under my example, you do a survey and you get a really robust response, and you get dozens and dozens and dozens of, of responses through the survey, which is great. Cadith requires each one of those clinicians to complete a conflict of interest declaration. And if you're managing that process, it will be your responsibility to make sure that that's done for each of those clinicians. And then finally, the last template, the reimbursement review feedback on draft recommendation template, the one that everybody uses. There are six yes or no questions. And I've listed them there. There are actually two questions in the fourth uh, bullet there. And just a reminder that if you answer no to a question, you get the opportunity to explain your answer. In fact, for the first question, you get to explain the answer whether you answer yes or no. So the very first question is, does the stakeholder agree with the draft recommendation? Yes or no? And you get to answer, you get to provide some detail there regardless of how you answer it. But after that, for the remaining five questions, if you answer yes, all you do is tick the box and go to the next one. If you answer no, you get the opportunity to explain your answer. Okay, let's shift gears and let me briefly outline the drug review process in Quebec. Just again, very briefly. In Quebec, manufacturers submit branded drugs, generics, and biosimilars to NS, first bullet there, for evaluation for listing on their public formulary. Um, after approximately a six month, six month review process, a recommendation is made to the health minister to list or not list a drug. Uh, he or she typically acts on the recommendation, in fact, very rarely goes against it. 
And there is an opportunity for input, just like we reviewed for uh, patient groups and clinicians at Cadet. There is an opportunity for input in Quebec, but it's actually or technically public input. Uh, so what we call stakeholder or public uh, evidence submissions play an important role in the drug evaluation process in Quebec. Uh, and I think as far as I know, it's still a questionnaire format. It used to be, uh, there was no structure to it at one time. It was just send us your thoughts, send us your input, uh, sort of just like in a Word document. Um, they moved to a questionnaire and as far as I know, they continue to use a now more structured uh, approach to providing or to requesting input from uh, from the public. And now we move to the final phase, which is really two phases to the overall reimbursement schematic. PCPA, the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, established in August of 2010, conducts joint provincial territorial negotiations for brand name. Uh, and generic drugs to achieve greater value for publicly funded drug programs. You can read their objectives there. That's off of their uh, relatively newly launched, I guess, within the last year website. All brand name drugs coming forward for funding through CDR and PCODER are considered for negotiation through the Pan-Canadian uh, Pharmaceutical Alliance, ideally um, concluding with a letter of intent, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. Considered, even after you get out of CADETH, whether you have a positive recommendation from CADETH, remember CADETH only issues recommendations, they don't make decisions, provinces make decisions, or whether it's a negative recommendation, um, then you are, you can be considered for negotiation through PCPA. You're not entitled to go into PCPA, as you'll see in a moment. Um, PCPA member jurisdictions include uh, public drug plans or cancer agency participation from all of the provinces, all of the territories, and three, three of the six federal drug plans. Three of the federal drug plans are not part of PCPA. I don't know why. Um, and just a note there in red, uh, and this is on their website, and that's why I quoted it for you. Any letters, documents, and other additional information or requests for in-person meetings can be directed to PCPA at Ontario.ca. Um, you, uh, Um, that's a big change because when PCPA was founded, it was very much founded as a negotiation to conclude an agreement between two parties, the governments, provinces, territories, the drug plans, public drug plans, and manufacturers. And the rest of us really had no role to play in that exercise. That has evolved. And while we're still not at the table, it's still fundamentally a negotiation between two parties, uh, they do now offer the opportunity for input from stakeholders outside of those two parties. Here are the most recent numbers, or at least as of last week, May uh, March the 8th, from the PCPA website. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of, mechanics of exactly how PCPA works, it's important to remember that the outcome of a PCPA negotiation is a signed letter of intent. Again, not a, not a national product listing agreement because product listing agreements are not national, they're provincial. They're still entered into with individual jurisdictions. Now, what is a letter of intent? What does this mean? Well, in essence, I'm not gonna give you a legal definition, but in essence, a letter of intent is a written agreement that says, I plan on entering into an agreement. Um, they're non-binding. Um, the letter of intent that comes out of PCPA, if you get a letter of intent, does not compel the provinces 
to follow the content in the letter of intent. Why? Section 92, because the provinces retain exclusive jurisdiction to decide what drugs they're going to pay for. So in really simple terms, what you want to have happen if you're a manufacturer is you want to have your letter of intent and all the content that's contained in it that's been negotiated through the PCPA process to simply be dropped into a product listing agreement, an actual legal formal contract with exactly the same terms and everything intact. But the provinces are not obligated to do that. They're not obligated to do that. Also note that negotiations can be unilaterally closed on a manufacturer, leaving patients without access to treatment. Those are the ones um, that are completed negotiations. You see 410 on the screen without an agreement, 54. So they talked, they negotiated, but they didn't reach an agreement. There was no LOI, no letter of intent. And that can conclude in any way, shape, or form, including PCPA just saying, we don't want to talk to you anymore. And that's happened. That's why I use that as an example. But it can break down for any number of reasons. And finally, on this slide, provinces can opt out of a PCPA negotiation at any time. They can opt out at the engagement letter phase. That's the very, very beginning of the process where, where all of the parties sign an engagement letter saying, we're going to start talking. During the negotiations, you can be right in the midst of going back and forth and talking, and a province who had, who had agreed to the engagement letter can say, I'm out. And then even at the LOI stage, you're on the verge, everybody's sitting down conceptually, not physically, are ready to sign this thing. A province who has been there right from the beginning all the way through, could have been a very active negotiator, says, I'm not signing. They are entitled to do that. When that happens, patients in those provinces, provinces that opt out, um, could be without access to that treatment in theory forever. Forever, at least as it relates to the public formulary, their public formulary in that province. And finally, this is my last slide, the last step, uh, when we say the drug actually gets into the patient or to the patient. This is it. So in addition to the 19 distinct public drugs drug plans, each province has a drug plan, three territories have a drug plan, the federal government runs six public drug plans. It's also important to remember that each one has its own eligibility criteria, who they will cover, as well as what medications they will cover and how those medications will be covered. Again, why? Section 92 of the Constitution Act. There is no obligation on a given public drug plan to provide medications to anyone, anybody. There's not even an obligation to have a public drug program in your province. We do in each of them, but there is no legal, constitutional, or otherwise obligation that they have to have one. And that's why the plans are so different. All of the public drug plans cover people over the age of 65. But after that, they diverge. Not dramatically, necessarily, but they do diverge um, after people over the age of 65. And as discussed in last month's webinar, the Canada Health Act does not apply to medications delivered outside of a hospital, including on an outpatient basis. So again, if you rely on one of the 19 public drug plans, then you're going to see differences depending on where you live or which one of those plans covers you uh, in particular. And that's it. Layla? Great, thank you so much, Ryan, for that presentation. So we have some questions already, but if you still uh, have questions, don't forget to submit them. So our first question is, can you comment on the new provisional treatment algorithm and if there are opportunities for input by clinicians and or patients? I can't comment on that specifically. I'm aware of it, but I don't have uh, any measure of understanding that would allow me to answer your question, so I apologize. 
Uh, next question. Can you provide an estimate of how long it takes for an SAP to be approved or denied once it is submitted to Health Canada? Yeah, so it's supposed so their guidelines say 24 hours within 24 hours. I don't have um, well, in fact, it says requests made from a healthcare professional are processed within 24 hours of receipt. Now that says processed. Um, I believe that their target is to get you an answer within that 20, sorry, to get the clinician an answer within that 24 hour period, more 48 hours, but one, that doesn't mean the drug is going to be in the patient in 24 hours. They st it still has to come from somewhere. And two, that also doesn't mean that because they don't deal with funding, that the funding question can't be answered. The drug doesn't just come across the border free of charge. There is no entitlement whatsoever to the medication free of charge. SAP has nothing to do with money. So while the SAP's actual guidelines over the content that they have jurisdiction over, meaning the yes or no doctor, you can bring this in for your patient, is usually done their target within 24 hours. I have no reason to believe it's otherwise. The mechanics, the actual how long does it take from when that yes comes across to when the patient gets the drug, I would imagine it could vary dramatically. Um, it could probably take weeks. I, I, I don't know, depending on the circumstance. Or it could, it, it could happen very quickly if the issue of uh, physical importation and the issue of who's going to pay for it is resolved. Uh, next question. You mentioned that drugs that do not receive letters of intent from the PCPA process may never be available to patients. Is there any recourse available for patients who desperately want a specific drug? There's, there's no recourse for an individual who relies on one of the public formularies. However, there is a tremendous amount that a patient community, a clinician community, can do to engage that province that has opted out. Uh, and we do a lot of this work through advocacy. Um, you will go to a province who has opted out and you will engage and undertake an advocacy campaign to prompt, ideally, that province to reconsider its position of having opted out of the LOI and to provide funding for patients in that province, but there's nothing that an individual person can do. No, no. Uh, next question. I get the impression that the drug approval process in Canada is quite involved. Is its current structure by necessity very thorough or would you consider it a little burdensome? I would consider it to be um, uh, certainly very challenging for patients who are waiting for medications, particularly in the rare disease area. I think that there is some measure of duplication. Um, I think it must be very frustrating for people who are waiting and in need of, of medications. I understand, generally speaking, or the bulk of why the things that are being done are being done. It doesn't mean I accept them, but I understand them. Um, I worked in government at a time when it was very different. The drug was approved by Health Canada. Uh, a manufacturer with their notice of compliance came to Ontario and said, will you list this drug? Full price, by the way, full price. Ontario said yes or no, and that was it. Now, as a taxpayer, that's not a great deal because everybody, all the public drug plans were paying full price for everything all the time. So as a taxpayer, what we have now is better. But as a patient waiting for a medication, it's a lot longer process, a lot longer, a lot more involved. And so I guess the answer to your question is, it depends on your perspective, quite frankly. And of course, patients and caregivers are also taxpayers so I mean you can be one of you you know millions of us are one in the same of course right so um, but it really depends on perhaps rather than um, your perspective is how you look at it uh, in a given circumstance uh, but it is quite a drawn a long drawn out process 
And as you'll recall from that initial slide that I put up there, you're talking about um, three plus years. It can be done less, it can be done quicker. When I say three plus years, I'm talking about from when a manufacturer submits to Health Canada through until product listing agreement is concluded for with the last province, for example. Let's use that as the measure. Three years is not uh, atypical at all. It can be done quicker. It's not often done quicker. And three years, I mean, that that's that's just a that's a that's a starting point. I mean, it isn't just like five years, seven years, ten years. It's never. It's never. There, there are products that have never been publicly funded, will never be publicly funded, at least the prospect of them be pu being publicly funded. There isn't any prospect of them being publicly funded because somewhere in that process, they got stalled and, and they fell off. So that's the way it's set up. Uh, so this is kind of related to the previous question. But considering how quickly we've been able to approve the various COVID-19 vaccines, do you think that there's more that can be done to expedite the process for approving cancer drugs? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think there is. I, I think that um, maybe I'll answer the question this way, which may seem kind of odd. I described to you how simple the process was before, and, I, and I'm not suggesting, oh, we should just go back to that. But I described to you how simple it was before. So over the last 20 plus years, we've we've gone from something that was that was very simple, good or bad, and we built it into quite a complex process. Well, if we did that, then surely we, the collective we, have the ability to streamline that process, cut it back, make it more efficient, eliminate certain components, have greater uh, concurrency, any number of things to try to cut down on some of the timelines, whether you're talking about in cancer or even outside of, of cancer. I mean, surely we have the ability to do that. Um, the question is, who's gonna do that? Who's gonna take that initiative? Um, that's really what it's down to. And so a lot of the work that on a very simple level to a very complex problem is people engaging and saying to decision makers who are involved in all of this sort of stuff, we need to look for ways to expedite this. And you saw with COVID-19 and the vaccines, boy, they sure expedited it. So it's possible. We've just lived through it. We're still living through it. But is the will going to be there to do it? Well, I would suggest to you only if people are engaged and prompt decision makers to actually try to do something, is, is anything gonna change? Uh, next question, do we ever find out what impact, if any, patient group input submissions have on the final decisions that are made about the approval of new drugs? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a question that's been around ever since the patient input process has been at Cadith. And um, I can only tell you that the quality of the patient input submissions in particular has improved dramatically over the years, and that's a good thing. I don't have any anecdotal evidence to suggest whether it you know, can or can't make a difference or whether it does or doesn't, or did or didn't make a difference in a particular circumstance. Um, I do believe it's becoming more important to the process as the quality of submissions has gone up. And um, it's kind of one of those good faith things uh, that you either do or don't have, as in you either do or don't have faith that if they're calling for this input and it's quality input from the patient perspective, it's a good submission, that it isn't given some measure of weight. The question becomes how much weight is it given? And I've never sat around that table, so I, I, I can't and don't want to speculate. Um, but it is just one factor that goes into the ultimate recommendation. Again, not decision, recommendation. Um, 
and I think it's the only formal one we have. So we have to continue to to pursue it and just have them get better and better and better. And and they are. I'm very pleased with this streamlining that has occurred, for example, since the fall of last year. I think it's a good thing. We're going, we're continuing to go in the right direction, especially considering where we came from. Um, things are getting better. So let's hope that that streamlining translates into greater weight being given when those uh, deliberations are, are happening. Uh, next question, what is the best mechanism for an individual patient who ha who wants to participate in the input process uh, to get involved in such a way that their opinion is likely to be considered? Yeah, another great question. So um, the, the first step would be to contact uh, a patient organization if there is a patient organization uh, in the disease area that you're referring to. Uh, would be to approach them to find out, do they do patient input submissions? If they do, um, ask them if you could be involved in providing input. Do they do surveys? Do they do telephone interviews? How do they gather information from individuals like yourself? If they don't do them, then I would encourage them to do one. And you could potentially, all, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the guidance is on the CADETH website. It tells patient groups how to do these uh, more or less from start to finish, and so there there is some there is some guidance on the website. There are people like me who who provide patient groups and clinician groups with the service of helping them uh, do these things uh, as well. If there isn't a patient group and you can't find a patient group, then what you probably need to do is contact Cadith send them an email and just say, you know, introduce yourself. This is a disease area. I understand there's an opportunity for public input um, or I should say, sorry, patient group input. I can't find a patient group. I, I, I want to provide input, but I can't find a patient group. Can you put me in touch with a patient group, which they could do. They might, they, they, they may very well know of one. Or if there isn't a patient group, please tell me how I can provide direct input. So I think those are the steps that I would follow if I were an individual sitting out there saying, hey, how can I get heard? Uh, I would suggest what I what I just outlined. Okay, thank you. So I believe that's it for questions and we're just about at the two o'clock mark. So we'll move on uh, to uh, concluding for today. So thank you again, Ryan, for this really excellent presentation and for breaking down a really complex topic and process for everybody. So we do have another webinar uh, scheduled for next week. Our next webinar will be on March 25th at one o'clock uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Time. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Paul Rogers from the DC Children's Hospital and the University of British Columbia uh, on the topic of nutrition surveillance and counseling for cancer survivors. Uh, registration information about this webinar will be sent uh, to everybody after today. Uh, thank you everybody again for joining us and take care.